What's happening guys, welcome back to another show. This week we've got a top, top guest. It's Danny Buck returning, the part two. Uh, Danny came on the show, I think on the second episode. I've uh, been trying to get him back uh, for a long time. He's been, you know, a couple of times, but now getting back to just really talk about his stuff, his individual work. He works at Arsenal uh, now with the 16s and 15s as an individual coaching specialist. So, like I say, you know, I've said a lot in the past, uh, Danny's one of the best coaches I've ever seen. You know, I've travelled around the world. He's top, top draw. Uh, really helped develop me as a coach, understanding how to work with elite players in that elite environment and that quality ball work and 1v1. So, just to get him on the show again, talk about what's been happening and obviously his methodology and what he's doing now and uh, yeah like I say we talk a lot about that technical work that individual work how important it is uh, what it looks like uh, if you want to know more about individual work ball mastery and 1v1 check out the My Personal Football Coaches level 1, level 2, 1v1 and ball mastery uh, on sale now but without further ado let's get into the show so Danny Buck welcome back to the show hello Saul how are you? very well mate how are you doing? all good thank you mate thanks for having us Good. Well, look, thanks for coming back. Look, it's been a while since you've been on the show. I think you're on the number two, and this is 104 or something, so it's been a long time. So um, when we last spoke, you were working a lot with the younger groups at Arsenal. Now you're working with a lot of the older groups. I just be, I thought it'd be quite interesting to have a conversation about, you know, the differences and approaches for different age players, technical and tactical approach, those sorts of things, you know, the, the sorts of things you, you want to do, particularly when you work with older players to get those good quality technical outcomes. So... Why tell us a bit about that then in terms of like recently, you know, what's the difference between, you know, working with, you know, from the top end of the YDP from working with the foundation phase in terms of like you still want to get these, you know, technical outcomes, these technical players. But what's how does your approach change? How do you balance that of everything else that's going on? Yeah, I mean, where to where to start? It's as wide ranging subject as you can get, really, isn't it? But I mean, you, I think. You know, obviously, from the, the experience we had when we was at Tottenham. And I think, you know, allowing those younger age groups to be freer, more expressive, you know, hearing tactical stuff at nines and tens does frighten me a little bit. And we're fortunate at our, at our club where, you know, that's not the case. But, you know, you do see it up and down the country. And, you know, I think if you want to have really technical dynamic players that can do a range of things that you need them to do in the modern game, then you've got to allow them to really express themselves at that younger age. So I think when you're looking at kind of the, the technical work you do with them, you know, the cuts, the chops, the one V one duels, you know, going over, going around one V ones, two V twos, three V all them things are going to be as important at 16 as they are at under nine. The difference is, I suppose, you know, how they implement it in the game, they're obviously not going to know that as well at nine as they are at, at, at 16. And how you allow them to make those mistakes, become, you know, those exciting type, well-rounded players, you know, you know, from being at Spurs, Chris Ramsey wouldn't have minded if you lost by a couple of goals, you know, if they were playing in a certain, certain way that um, him and John wanted you to play. That's not the case at every club, you know, and I think that's probably... The big difference, I think, between the little ones at nine, ten, and stuff like that, and the older age is just how you allow that freedom to happen. You still would allow it to happen at sixteen and that, but they've got to be a little bit more, you know, tactically aware of when and where. And I think if you do a really good job at the beginning, it makes it a lot easier at, at, at the end. So for me, I think that's kind of where 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 it would start. But still, you know, your sixteens. 15s that I'm working with more this year and stuff like that. That technical work is vital. And I always go back to the experience of, you know, going over to Real Madrid when I was in, in the early 2000s and seeing Victor Del Bosque was, you know, Zidane and all that lot. I had the ball each for 20 minutes at the beginning of the session. You know, they were working as much technically as anyone. You watched the first team train when Arsene Wenger was here at the club, which was, I was lucky to do on, on a few occasions. You know, they're coming out, they're straight on the ball, they're taking it on the back foot, they're you know, take doing 1v1s, they're doing, you know, it's the technical work just never stops if you want to keep developing technically excellent players, I think, to be quite honest with you. It's interesting, yeah, it's a lot to unpick there. So just go back to then, so I mentioned sort of, sort of you say sort of it's pretty similar in approach to how you, for example, the technical work you do in a session with the 16s or 15s now, is it similar sort of stuff that maybe a bit more expanded that you, you would do with the 8s, 9s and 10s and 11s? Yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's massively different, to be quite honest with you. You know, sizes and, and things like that, it, it, it might be. But, you know, the kind of 
like 1v1 practices that I'll do or individual ball work unopposed and stuff like that or semi-opposed is very similar to what I would have done with a 9s and 12s to what I do with a 15s and stuff like that. You know from working with Ricardo, he would be doing a session with the first team at Spurs and he'd go over and do almost exactly the same session with the 8s. It would just be different with the size of the pitch and, you know, he didn't really talk to him any different either, which was always entertaining. But, you know, obviously your language and how you get those things across will be different in your delivery, but actual kind of the the practice is similar. And then it's obviously then the detail, you know, older kids are going to be able to take on certain different things to, to the younger lads and what have you. But I think it, it might gonna... be a bit of a misconception thinking you've got to completely rip it up and do something different. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm convinced that's the right thing to do. Give us an example then, like a typical now, what, what would a technical work look like then when you're doing like a 15s and 16s session? Um, I think, you know, Ball each, we always like to start with ball each, whether that's, you know, doing cuts, you know, kick-ups, you know, we, we, we do a lot of that for the dynamic movements, you know, so you're not having to just do stretches without a ball, a lot of those kind of things we can do with a ball and we, we do work on those kind of bits. I think you've then got, you know, the uh, kind of how you get that into a semi approach practice. I think that's the best thing we probably lost, we learned off Ricardo, wasn't it? So, you, you know, back in the old days, we would have gone from unopposed to opposed. And he really did show us how you can use that semi-opposed a lot more and the intelligence around that, about really learning how to use your body and everything like that. So I think we've, you know, I, we do do a lot of that and getting players to really understand either how to protect or how to defend in those situations and be a bit more twisty turny and, you know, keeping ball safe side and what have you. So we'll work a lot on that. And then it depends on the kind of units we're working on. So, you know, if we're working with midfielders, we'd be playing a lot of, um, type of passes we want them to play whether it's a simple one taking it on the back foot and playing or whether it's around the corners or reverse on the ground reverse in the air you know through ball you know it's a real mixture depending on what we're working on and the group we're working on stuff like that but the fundamentals of being able to cut the ball well manage the ball well have your head up you know deal with a variety of different receiving techniques where the ball's in the air, the ball's bouncing, the awkward ones and all those kind of things. So it's not the traditional, the ball's on the deck and, you know, just receiving it how you would normally receive it, nice and simple with no with no problem. So I think it's a real mix of all those kind of things, really, to be, to be honest with you, and try and link it to the theme of what we're working on. You know, it's like how we teach the individual within the team environment. So you, you teach the tactic without it being the, the, the boring tactic one. You know, you might set your passing practice up to replicate what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do a skip pass, you might set up a practice to allow you to do that. Do you know, it's it's little kind of nuances that you would do a bit more tactically with the older boys to kind of drum home certain principles that you're trying to achieve. And, and so just talk about you talk about going over and go around. Can you just remind listeners what, what that means? What, you, what do you mean by those two those two key things in 1v1? So going over is facing the opponent up going past the player, going around as you're receiving it with the player to your, to your back. Um, yeah, I keep forgetting, talking talking the language we're always comfortable with. But, you know, and it's amazing how many 1v1 practices you see where there's a lot of going over, but not as much going around. And I think it's something we, we need to coach more. It's something I'm very conscious of trying to coach a lot more now, particularly as learning how to feel where that player is and how to beat them. You know, Frank Lampard was amazing it wasn't it how we could receive the ball in the first touch and beat the player and how we can kind of get more of that in our practice both from kind of trying to make space so you can front the player up and if you can't front the player up how you either hold on to it and link people up or how you you individually go around the player I think you know that's something that I've been conscious of trying to coach more as I've got a little bit older because I think you look at a lot of turnovers in a the game, they actually happen when players have got their back to players, either taking too many touches or turning when they haven't scanned or whatever kind of thing. So I think it's a very important element of what we do. But ultimately, if your body shape's wrong to receive, if your cuts are poor, if you can't keep the ball safe side, if you don't use your arm well and stuff like that, which are all things that you kind of have to do to build in blocks in your unopposed practices or your semi-opposed practices, and you're never going to get to where you need to get to with a, the kind of real opposed when you're trying to, when you're under intense pressure. So, you know, it's how that all kind of builds up. I think it's really, really important within your sessions. How I, have you like, do you think about how, how much weight you put to either one, the going over, going around? Are you thinking now, especially with the older boys, maybe you, you concentrate a little bit more of the going around because it is a bit more, like you say, that's a key, you know, that's a bit more an area where maybe players losing the ball a bit, or is it just you're, you're, you're doing 
both of them or is it position maybe you see you're more reactive you're seeing what the players need how does that work in terms of like I don't call it technical periodization but I mean in terms of like you know if your your thoughts about how much of each are you giving those players I think it's um, a little bit of both really you've got to look at what the individuals need as well um, uh, you know what what are they capable of doing you know you might look at that in your extras and stuff like that what are the group capable because it's not a one size fits all you know the technical programs have got to be right for the individual players and, and what have you but i wouldn't say i do more one or the other i try and make sure there's a real good balance of both because i think both are really really important and if your movement's good and stuff like that you will end end up going around uh, going over players more than around really you know around is when your marks and your movement might not quite have been good enough or the other team are doing a, a good job and, and what have you or particularly if teams are playing a low block against you which you know we get quite a lot at our club You've got to, you're going to be in the going around situation more than the going over. Do you know what I mean? You've got to find coping mechanisms for that and how you do it. So I think ultimately I try and make sure there's a good balance, but there's going to be certain individuals that need more of one or the other. And a lot of it actually sort of comes down to their, their movement before they receive it, to be quite honest with you. You know, and some of the situations is not that they're poor 1v1, they're just poor at getting themselves in the right situations to go 1v1, whether that's going over, going around, whatever kind of thing. So. Interesting. And and how how um, how important is it, or is it important to educate the players on that? So I mean, we, I mean, do you talk talk to players about right? This is going over. This is going around. Do you, I mean, what I'm trying to say is like, you know, is it important the older boys or even with the younger boys to you know up, upskill them, educate them on the actual different scenarios so they can recognise it. They're okay, right? I recognise now. I've got pressure. I've got to go around, sort of thing. Or is it more, you know, you're learning, you know, through the those 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 practices, that sort of stuff. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's I think it's all of it, and you've got obviously we've got the analyst side of things as well, where the players can watch the videos back, and we can show the players this, that, and the other. Really, so I think ultimately it's putting them in as many different situations as you possibly can in your practices. Not always having the same. The ball always comes from this direction or whatever, or you're always getting pressure. It's about creating as many different opportunities for them to receive the ball in different situations and find ways of dealing with it. It's, it, it, I, was, I was saying just the other day to one of the younger coaches at the club, like you see a lot of one v one practices that have mini goals, but you don't see lots that have like an end zone to run into because you could shift it and go and finish in the mini goal, which is an important skill, no problem. But sometimes you've got to get past the player. It's not just about getting it and shifting it. Sometimes you've got to really get past them. And Ricardo talked about this, didn't he? About the you know your power and your ability to keep going and getting really past the player. And I think that's something that's always resonated quite quite a lot with me and. I think that's why the more you create variety, um, both in how they receive it, the situation they receive it, and then also what the goal of that practice is, you know, what have you got to achieve? It could be you're just trying to hold it up and then play someone in. That's a practice mm -hmm. within itself, isn't it? So uh, I just think it's that sort, really. And then just in the game, seeing how that manifests itself, seeing how their movements work. But again, it always comes down to then the unopposed stuff, help showing them the kind of movements to do how you come short, how you come long and, you know, all those different different types of movements to get in. And then what do you then see when it goes to semi-opposed to opposed? Yeah, interesting. And how much time would they spend on that? For example, you know, you've got, you've got a, a week. How much How much individual, is it a bit, you do a bit of ball work and 1v1 every session or is it part of, how, how does that look on a general week? So they always do ball work in the session. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Won't always be 1v1s, but we do do a lot of duels because, Football is about duels, so it's really important. Um, but we do a lot of, um, uh, we have a plan how we touch the individuals all the way through the week and through the month and about how much they get on very specific areas within their position they play or what their needs are and everything like that. So, you know, we have like development clubs and, and things like that where we'll do extras with the players every single session, whether that's before or after. And then, yeah, in general, the sessions, they will start with a ball each or with a passing practice within small numbers or, you know, some sort of technical practice will always start the sessions um, without without a doubt. And as I say, some of that's just done in a development club within smaller groups. You know, some of that is during the session, one or two, three players might get pulled out of the session that's going on and we'll go and work some specific technical bits. Some of that might be unopposed. Some of that might be semi-opposed. Some of that might be opposed. You know, might have a defender with a winger trying to, you know, expose the defender 1v1, try and get the winger better 1v1, you know, little things like that. So it's not a, we do this, this day, and it's exactly the same. It's really, we 
plan it out. We have a look at what people need, have a look at what the week looks like as well, because, you know, with all these cup games and everything like that, you know, the fixtures can come thick and fast nowadays. And it's just how we make sure that the, the, the players are getting what they need in that, in that place. And I think it helps when you, the more experience you get with it, the more you understand it and how to fit it in and when to work it, when not to work it and all those kind of bits. Do you know what I mean? And I think we do a pretty good job of finding that balance, to be honest with you. Because it's, it's, I think it's, it's pretty unique at the moment. There's not that many clubs will have like an individual coach specialist with each age group. So I'm interested. How does that work in terms of you know how do how do you how do you line yourself with with the other coaching staff and what would they come in and say okay you know what's your thoughts or you know you, you know player A needs to work a bit in this can you take them out or I mean how do how do you how do they utilize you basically or as your skill set as an individual you know technical specialist. Yeah, I mean, it's all credit to the club, isn't it, of having the the vision of understanding how important the individual development was in within the team context, you know what I mean? And we're really lucky that we've, we, we've got, you know, leaders that have allowed us to do that. And I think, you know, it, I have a lot of dialogue with the head coach, Josh. Josh does a, Josh Smith does a brilliant job with all of this, of how he balances it and how he's thinking about what he needs to do with the players and what all the players need. I've done documents for him and emails for him and people like Matty Joseph about what I think the players need. Like when we were away in Sunderland at the tournament a couple of weekends ago, I'd done a technical analysis of every single player, the good, the bad and the indifferent and what I think we need to work with them for the rest of the season. So it's it's great that I have the lens of I'm looking at technically what I think those players need for their position and to be rounded um, Arsenal football players. And then I'll have a look, you know, the Game Insight coach, about kind of the tactical elements we might be looking at, like I use the example of skip pass. So my passing practices, if we're working on a certain element, I will design it. So we might be taking on back foot or playing around the corner, but they have an element of a skip pass in it just to get the kind of the principle of either the midfielder dropping deep or going longer to open up the wide player or whatever it is. Those kind of things I'm trying to incorporate into my technical practices more. And I think we talk a lot, and I think that shows in the planning and the delivery of, of what we're doing. At the end of the day, the communication's got to be strong because you can't have one person saying one thing and another person saying the other. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, thus far, I must say, and to be fair, the other years that I've worked, you know, I've been doing the individual coach element of what, um, of my role at Arsenal for the last four years. And whether it's Birch, whether it's Pilsey, whether it's Dan Machichi, you know, it's, they've all used me really, really well in, in, in that regard. And, um, trusted me to get on with it a little bit really um so yeah it is interesting and it does mean that in a game day i'm looking at 90 percent, 80 percent of what i'm looking at is around how they're technically influencing the game and then what i've got to take away from that and go and develop and so, and what about yourself i mean your own methodology obviously you've been doing this over 20 years you know without bigging you up too much probably one of the best in the game one of the best i've seen anyway in terms of you know deliverers in terms of a practitioner in, in, in this area particularly, what do you do? To, what tell us about your own this methodology yourself in terms of, for example, you know the, the the ball work at the beginning gives a key few things which you've you know you've learned over the years about what makes a really effective you know ball work session. Um, I'll go back to what Chris Ramsey told me twenty five years ago at Barnet about if you want to be able to play reverse passes, if you want to be able to strike the ball well, if you can't cut it, you've got no chance. And I think that ankle strength, ankle flexibility, hip flexibility, all those kind of things are critical to producing very, very good football players who can do things that other players can't do. And I think you're never going to get away from the fundamental importance of your cuts, your inside, your outside cuts, and how you dynamically move, how your, uh, you know, how your weight transfers from the turn out. You know, you remember when we had Edgar Davies at Spurs and he used to join in, didn't he, with some of the technical practices when the, we were doing in services and the way that guy twisted off, he almost was out the turn before he was even finished with the turn. And I think creating that dynamic type of player, whether you're a centre half or whether you're a forward, they're going to be really important things to do. So I think the fundamentals of what I've done around those kind of areas hasn't changed in the last 25, 27 years, to be quite honest with you. And that's a still a lot of stuff that we do um, about getting the players to be able to get their ankle and body in a position to move, manipulate the ball in the direction they need to do it, not where they're limited to do it. So again, in your practice, like my practices at the, like the beginning when we're doing cuts, I won't always put the cones in the same place. 
So your twist off might take you there, but another week it might take you further around or less around. So you have to make sure that your touch is getting you into the right direction. It's it's little nuances like that that we do a lot of, and I see them as fundamentally important because you can't be a good ball striker. You can't play certain passes if you can't manipulate your body and have that ankle strength and flexibility to deliver it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because that's a lot, lot, a lot of what people one of the main misconceptions or people forget or don't understand or they you know or they don't see the value because they don't the the importance of developing the body for the modern game right so you're explosive you're dynamic your movement your ability your balance your coordination and these are all the sort of extra sort of additional outcomes or the outcomes you get from quality quality ball work right 100 percent. and i've had some really good conversations over the last six years with sports science strength and condition guys that i really respect and physios about certain movements that they see that's really important for the modern game and what they're doing with first team players to make them more dynamic. And what I've tried to do is look at those moves and think how I can incorporate them moves into the ball work. So even like a sway practice where people will know strength and conditioning practice, I've incorporated that into having a ball as well. And, you know, it's, un I think us as coaches have got to understand that the game evolves, people evolve, and we've got to look at all the different areas, you know, different studies and all that lot to make our practices better. At the end of the day, there's some fundamentals that are never going to change. They are what they are. And I think that's one of the things I've been keen to do is when you're in the game a long time and you 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 think you do things quite well, you don't want to end up doing the same thing all the time. You've got to see how it evolves, how you can make it better, how the game is changing, how studies might change your view and things like that. Do you know what I mean? So there's little kind of almost nuances to the delivery that's ever evolving if you're open-minded enough to look at it and try stuff and see what works. You know, I, I always say to our strength and conditioning guy when we're doing the cuts, come and watch, see what the change of direction is like, see what see what you think is good, bad or indifferent, please get involved, see what that might influence your practice or something that you think I might be missing. I think those kind of things are really, re really critical, to be honest with you. And that means you can then understand the detail and coach the detail. I think one of the things that, for me, one of the reasons why people don't like doing the unopposed or maybe the semi-opposed stuff is because it's you've got to know the detail and you've got to be good enough to be able to coach it and you've got to have the experience to coach it. And it's not an easy thing to do and it's not an easy thing to go and learn. And I think if you haven't got that, then you can be teaching them the wrong things. And, you know, you've got to put yourself out there a little bit, really. And it is hard, you know, when you're dealing with really, really good young football players, they're going to stretch you and you've got to be able to try and improve those players. And it's it's not easy. You know, there's players that are, are Arsenal that really stretch me as a coach still. And that's brilliant. You know, that's what you want. And um, I've got to go away and have a real think about things and look at stuff and think about how I can keep pushing them on. And uh, that's part of the challenge of why I still do it, I think. Interesting. And I mean, tell us about the cuts then. I mean, tell us, I mean, what's, how many different moves or, you know, turns or cuts or 1v1 moves do you, do you use? Do you, do you focus on specific ones or is it... You know, is it just an ongoing list? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, there's loads in there. And to be honest with you, I keep trying to come up with new ones, you know, seeing what players might do in a game or, you know, you, you might see something that you like to look of and adapt it yourself. And I just try and keep a bit of variety with it. There's some, you know, practices that I've probably had for most of my coaching career, to be honest with you, that still work well in the context of what they're working on. Obviously, it depends on load as well. You know, a day where we might be pushing them, you might work over bigger distances, you might do more cuts, really, you know, be technique under fatigue. Another day might be slightly different because of the loadings that the players need and what have you. You might mix it up with a passing drill. You know, there, there's something I've done a lot more of now where there might be a passing practice and then on one pole or mannequin or whatever kind of thing, there's, an un there's a player giving semi-opposed pressure, player receives it, two cuts, and then off they go again. It's like, do you know what I mean? It's trying to freshen it up, but ultimately the kind of real principles and the important detail bits are the same, depending, it doesn't matter what practice you're doing really. Even in an unopposed practice with no defender, when they turn, I'm still talking about them, about where their arm position is, you know, the habits. As soon as you're coming out that turn, how quickly you get your eyes up, how you look out from the peripheral vision and stuff like that. It's little bits where you're trying to chip away at habits and get them doing good things as well as doing the actual move and the practice well, if that makes any sense. Do you have like? Do you think there's like a core 
some core skills that you think are the most important movements if you were going to like choose you know a top five or six the ones that you know you had to you know that would you really you know or a few that what would what more the key I mean, we always talked about the inside cuts and the outside cuts anything else where you think maybe with the core skills or the core movements that you really got to have um yeah definitely them so i think how you move and position your body to receive it's really important um and you know we spend a lot of time on getting the players just to kind of move off play you know like fabregas how he used to receive the ball how he used to be able to move off and take it on the back for how he was able to make that space to receive it and turn and face the player was i thought was always amazing i just you know for a player that wasn't you know physically the best player in the world he was always in space so so tell, think, tell us about that for describe for the listeners the fabregas movement what he used to do so he'll like be on a, like a defender would be marking him and how he kind of almost like went in and then pulled out and then was able to receive the ball on the back foot he was just i thought he was the best player i've ever seen do that and i think his body position to receive it, the timing of the movement, how he almost, you know, I almost call it pre-movement, how his movement before to receive it was just always great, you know, and it always got that bit of freedom. But his body position was always right, depending on the situation as well. So I think the core skills for me is, you know, the inside-outside cuts and your receiving techniques, not just the ball on the floor, when the ball's in the air or it's bouncing or whatever kind of thing. I think they're the the core ones you've got to get absolutely bang on, to be honest with you. And then all the other bits, you know, the ball striking is going to be vital, you know, and then that just allows you then to build all the rest of the variety up, I think, to be quite honest with you. So maybe cuts inside, outside, body position to receive, and the actual ball striking elements are probably your key, key uh, uh, parts that you've just got to have. Man, what advice would you give for like grassroots coaches who maybe only have players for like one hour a week and then they got the game on the weekend? How do they, you know, try and include some of this stuff in their work? It's funny because my son plays grassroots under 12s football. Two of my best mates run the team. So you can imagine how many times I get asked these, asked these questions. Um, and when I get roped in once a month to take the boys. But um, what I say to them is like at the beginning, just give them a ball each simple practices, cuts and stuff like that. 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, they're fun and they, the kids love it, like taking on their mates and do, doing all those bits and getting finishing in every practice. That's what I say to them really, because ultimately they have loads of fun. They get loads of touches of the ball. You can say all the tactics you like at grassroots. The, ki the kids aren't going to understand about inverting fullbacks and overlaps. There's no point, especially at under 12 at the level you know, that my son plays at. So, you know, get them as much ball time as possible, get them having fun, put them in loads of situations where they've got to fight to win because, it's, you know, they're, they're competitive, they want to do well and give them loads of finishing. You know, that's what I, I tell them. And then that lastly, just possession, you know, 4v2, 6v3s, um, you know, keeping the ball and moving it around the pitch and stuff like that. And, you know, I think you only sometimes get an hour a week, the grassroots coaches, don't they? You know, there's such a limited time you've got. And I think the more ball rolling time you get, the more contact time you get and everything like that will just make them better players because grassroots football, there's a lot of duels. Yeah, a lot of fight. There's a lot of transitions. So you might as well base your practices on that because that's mm. reality of what it will be. Do you know what I mean? So grassroots can sometimes be taken a bit too seriously by parents and stuff like that the kids are there to have fun and do as well as they possibly can do and i think you know you just got to create that environment for them and make sure that you, you, you're giving them every opportunity to get better but in a an environment where they're going to really enjoy it and want to come back every week and what about yourself like you know how do you keep yourself fresh i mean you mentioned it earlier about you know looking at studies and stuff how do you keep yourself fresh revitalized you know at the top of the game you know you know making sure that you're you know always challenging the players and challenging yourself i mean listen we're so lucky so at the club i'm at you know you you walk you walk like i said the other day you, you go through those gates you're working with the best staff in the country and you're working with the best players you can't go there and be average because the players are just not going to have it you know and the hierarchy wouldn't have it either and i think that's part of the challenge it's so different to my normal job you know that i do you know, I'll come off this and I'll have 100 emails to deal with, you know, and when you go on that pitch, you're just there, your sole focus is making these players better. And, you know, the, the players are so engaging, they push you so much. Um, and I love the kind of 
you know, top end really being challenged by really good players for me to put on better sessions, get across my information better and everything like that. So I have to go away and think about things, you know, like when I'm out running, I'll be thinking about sessions. You know, I'm listening to lots of podcasts or I'm reading lots of books about, you know, uh, well, I'm cheating. It's audio books. I'm not reading any books, really. Um, just to try and build up my knowledge base, really. But a lot of how I've developed things over my whole career has been watching the game. And, you know, my son loves football, so we end up watching actually more football than I was watching maybe a couple of years ago. And just watching what the best players do, I think, you know, just gives you ideas and inf still infuses me to come up with different ideas and make players better. And, you know, there's a lot of players that I've coached at some point in their academy life coming through the system now or in first team and it's just you know you know as a coach there's nothing better than seeing players that you've worked with go out there and you know do things that you've helped them do and the feedback you get off them you know thanks for this and you know it's like you get clips from their videos oh look at this look at this turn I kept it safe side you know even first team players send me those kind of things and I think that gives you the energy to keep wanting to do it really you know there's nothing better being on that pitch working with players for me. It's just the most enjoyable part, apart from when it's minus two and it's freezing and it's raining, which is most generally year. every week for us. Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? You know what I mean? And the setting as well at Howell End. Yeah. I mean, we've got the best pitches. It's a magnificent, you know, what a what a place to, to go and work for a few hours, a couple of what, times a week. What, what, would you, what would you do? What would you, how would you try and, you know, uh, encourage coaches or, you know, change coaches' mindset who say, you know, do you can get all your technical outcomes in a rondo or you can get all your technical outcomes in just a small sided game there's no need to do the the individual ball work it, it they'll just be limited it's it's as simple as that you know and i think if people don't listen to the experienced coaches that have done this for a long time seen a lot of cycles and seen what good and bad practice looks like i think ultimately if the, the players are not technically excellent, they ain't getting anywhere near the premiership or championship. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, you have to remove the physical element of academy players. If players are dominating 1v1 just because they're quick and strong, you've got to really, really look at why they're winning that duel. And the same for a, a, an undermaturated player. They could be doing all the right things, but just can't quite influence the game. We had it at Spurs with Harry Winks, didn't we? You know, he, Chris Ramsey always said it. He was doing all the right things, but just didn't have the physical bits to do certain elements. And, you know, he, he's obviously pushed on and having a really good career. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of... At the end of the day, if you don't give them a variety of practices, they're going to have limitations. If you just did unopposed, they're going to have limitations. If you did everything semi-opposed, they're going to have limitations. You've got to, you've got to be able to do it all. And the players have got to be able to do it all in all the settings. There's no point being a really good unopposed player and terrible in a match. And you know what it's like. You can sometimes see a player who's actually quite influential in the games, but in a technical practice breaks down. Now, we all know through the years that we've done this job that at some point that's going to catch him out, whether that's next year, two years, or when he's trying to get in the first team. So if we don't help that player, they're going to come up short. But sometimes people don't see that because they're influencing the game how they are. So I think ultimately, if you don't have a balanced program, if you don't have a balanced technical program that's got a mixture of everything and a load of variety and a load of things that are going to challenge them, they're going to come up short. You can't do everything in a match or a rondo. It's just impossible. I think that's a great point, isn't it? It's about balance. And they like, say you need a bit of this and a bit of that, and one doesn't work without the other. You know what I mean? And that's the key. Like if you're doing really good technical individual ball work and you've got that really good positional play or that possession play, you bring that together, that's like, you know, the perfect storm, right? Uh, 100%. And, you know, you just got to be really clever about how you put them together. And you, you don't want to do something just once. You've got to be, it's how are you kind of drum the fundamentals in of all the different bits that you're trying to get. And even kind of some of the kind of nuances with the with, with the moves, like I used the example to skip past a couple of times today, being able to do that in a technical practice, then in, you know, maybe a more of a kind of, you know, 6 3 3 or whatever kind of thing, and then in your kind of more match future, it just builds up that knowledge, I think, and helps them understand it. Because if they're always in the hurly burly, I'm not sure they're ever going to have the deep understanding of what's going on. And you know, you've traveled so far around the world and seen so much good practice it 
it is what the better clubs in the world do, isn't it? When you've gone around and seen the best people that are producing very, very good um, players for their first team at young ages, that, that's, that's what you're seeing, isn't it? It's not you're not seeing all of one uh, something and all of something else. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's what I would say to that, really. And just tell the listeners that what a skip pass is. Not pretty much, most a lot of people won't know what that is. So, like, say, uh, say the uh, CDM receives the ball, and you've got uh, a, a higher midfield player. He might drop down or run forward to open up the passing lane into the wide player. So you would skip that player to hit the next player. Man City use skip passes really, really well. Actually, when you watch them play, and you know how they do it, you know De Bruyne will miss out players and things like that. So that's what's meant by that. And then finally, what what, you, what advice would you give to a young coach who wants to upskill themselves on this type of work? It's difficult, obviously, is not that much in terms of you know in the, in the coaching courses, in the federations and stuff. What would you know? What, what would your advice be? Well, you know, obviously, you do a lot of good work around this, and you deserve a lot of credit for it. Um, I'm not, and I've seen obviously your comments on Twitter. Not everyone agrees with it, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. But I think you've got to be open minded, and you know, I was very, very lucky. You know, for all the kind of right thoughts I might have had about how the game was played, the coaches that I was able to have access to and watch when I was a young, impressionable coach just backed up what my beliefs were. And I saw really good practice from really, really good coaches. Not everyone gets that. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, that was just lucky timing for me, really, more than anything. But I think if people were open-minded, don't, you know... People are very strong and fixed in their views nowadays, aren't they? Like, this is the way to do it and you must do it. Or someone watches a practice that someone animates and puts puts all over uh, Twitter or X, whatever we've got to call it now, um, and just does that. You know, it's taking that and putting your spin on it or looking at how that's relevant for the game or whatever or your technical stuff that you're working on, your tactical bit. So I think you've got to be open-minded. You've got to watch as many people as you can. I wrote everything down as a young coach and then looked at it at home and got the Sabutio balled out and was working out how I could do different bits with it all and everything like that. Um, And you just got to listen to advice. You know, again, I was lucky. I, you know, coaches like, you know, Neil Bamford would tell you what he thinks, good or bad. And you had to take that on the chin and get on with it. Do you know what I mean? And I think that helped me as well. But if I was fixed minded with it, and not taking on the information, then I, you know, then I might not have developed as well as I think I did. So, yeah, I think it is the open mindedness. You know, don't go all down one street and just, you know, ask lots of questions, watch lots of sessions. Don't only go in if you're being paid. Put yourself out there. Go and find out loads of things. You know, I used to work every single day or observe every day when I started as a coach and got paid for about two of them. You know, because I wanted to get better and put myself out there. So I think that's. Probably the best advice I get. Look at all the how much stuff you've got access to nowadays. You know, it might be too much. Back when I started, there was nothing. There was dial-up internet, and that was it. You know, what I mean, it was, it's, you just had to watch DVDs or VHSs or whatever you could of old World Cups and God knows what else, and watch whatever game you could on TV. You know, it was just you got so much information out there now. You can go and go and really learn a lot of stuff, can't you? Bucky, thanks, mate. Pleasure as always. Legend. No, thank you, Saul. Keep up the good work.